Okay, so I'm going to, what we're going to do in this webinar is Paula is going to give a presentation and then I'm going to give a short presentation and then the rest of the webinar we will reserve for questions and answers. If there's not if we whip through this and there's not a whole lot of questions and discussion, then we might be able to wrap this up at the top of the hour. And if not, we'll uh, put it all over for another 15 minutes or so. Okay, so welcome. And I'll turn it over to Vivian to introduce Paul Howe. Thanks, Anita. Hi, everybody. Uh, since Anita gave a land acknowledgement, I'm going to try and do one too. Um, I'm on the traditional unceded territory of uh, the Mi'kmaq and uh, Wulistikwe peoples, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. And uh, we're very happy to have um, Paul Howe with us today to talk to us. Paul Howe is a professor of political science at the University of New Brunswick in Fredericton. His research looks at Canadian democracy with a particular focus on identifying the causes of political disengagement and on finding potential solutions to the problem. His most recent book is Citizens Adrift, The Democratic Disengagement of Young Canadians. It won the 2011 Donald Smiley Prize by the political, Canadian Political Science Association for the best English language book in Canadian politics and government. So congratulations to Paul for that and welcome, Paul. Great, thank you, uh, Vivian. And Thank you, Anita, for inviting me to, uh, to speak with everyone tonight. Um, I'll just share my screen. I have a PowerPoint to go along with my, uh, my presentation. So I'll just do that. Uh, there we are. And uh, I just have to be able to now. OK, I see. There we go. I think that's that's all right. So yeah, well, thanks to everyone who's who's here tonight. Um, and so I will be speaking then about obviously proportional representation for New Brunswick. Um, I don't know what people's level of background would be with this issue. I'm imagining quite a few people have a fair bit of background with it, uh, but maybe there's some others who don't uh, have as much, uh, haven't been involved in this for as long and don't know quite as much about it. So. Anyway, my talk is meant to provide a fairly broad overview of the different kinds of issues and considerations and a bit, and a bit of the history, certainly. Uh, but hopefully there's something uh, that's of use to, to everybody. So what I will talk about are uh, three, uh, three topics. Uh, first, I will talk about the New Brunswick experience with electoral reform. Um, and then I will talk about the Canadian experience with electoral reform. And then I'll talk about what we might think about looking forward, what Fair Vote Canada might be thinking about um, in terms of strategies and opportunities, uh, particularly with respect to the process, the process of trying to bring about electoral reform. And so, and what we're talking about here when we talk about the New Brunswick and Canadian experience is about a 20 year period that this uh, issue has been uh, discussed, debated, et cetera, in the Canadian and New Brunswick context. And, for myself, I came to uh, UNB in 2001, so I've been watching all of this from the vantage point of, of, of New Brunswick. And uh, like a lot of people watching things unfold, first of all, with a certain, quite a bit of excitement and anticipation, and then also with quite a bit of disappointment as various uh, efforts to bring about a change in electoral system uh, haven't come to fruition. So to start then with uh, New Brunswick, uh, I would say really there's two main phases where electoral reform has been discussed. Uh, and the first uh, involved the establishment by Bernard Lord in 2003 of the New Brunswick Commission on Legislative Democracy, uh, which was certainly a very welcome development. And this was a, a commission which had about eight or nine appointed members uh, and was given a fairly broad mandate to consider various aspects of how democracy functioned in New Brunswick. But certainly one of the main focal points was the electoral system and the commission uh, was a pretty extensive effort. Uh, it had quite a lot of public consultations around the province. It had a research uh, group. A lot of academics in the province were involved producing research papers. Did this work for about a year and ended up recommending that the province consider adopting the mixed member proportional model. 
uh, similar, of course, to what was used in Germany uh, and in New Zealand. And they laid out the model in a certain amount of detail uh, where there would have been 36 local MLAs, so continuing to have people representing local ridings, but also an additional 20 MLAs, uh, so-called list MLAs, who would have been taken from party lists uh, and they're thereby helping to achieve the proportional results uh, by having those additional MLAs to top up the party's results to get them in line with their share of the, uh, of the popular vote. And the province was going to be divided into four different regions with five of these, these list MLAs coming from each of the regions. And then in addition, the uh, commission recommended a 5% vote threshold for any party to gain seats, which again, it mirrors what we see in uh, New Zealand and in uh, Germany. And of course, the report talked quite a bit about how in its hearings and so forth, people were quite keen to still be able to retain the traditional local MLA, the local representative. So the mixed model was appealing because you have that, but then you also obviously achieve much greater proportionality. Uh, the plan then was that there was going to be a referendum held on this, uh, this model in, with the uh, 2008 elections, municipal elections, but when the Conservatives lost power, uh, the new uh, government under Sean Graham did not move ahead with holding that referendum. So phase two, we jump ahead of quite a few years, and uh, the issue then was revived in 2016 when the government of Brian Gallant uh, formed the New Brunswick Commission on Electoral Reform. Now, the process this time around was, to be honest with you, unusual in quite a few ways. Uh, it, was, it was very rushed. Uh, it didn't seem all that well thought, thought through. Um, first off, there was this odd way of actually choosing the commission because there were sort of some advertisements done, and I'm not sure how widespread they were, um, but in theory, the idea was anybody in the province could put forward their name, apply to be on the commission. Um, in the end, five people were actually picked to be part of the commission. And when you looked at who they were, there was a former MLA and speaker of the legislature. There was a former deputy minister. It was pretty clear. It looked much more like a traditional sort of commission with people who had experience in, in politics or in public affairs in some way who had been chosen. So the commission nonetheless in its report that it produced called itself a mini citizens assembly and it really wasn't that at all. Um, so there was that was one unusual thing about the process. Also very frustratingly for people who had been working for electoral reform, the government really tried to, you know, it set the stage, it, it limited what the uh, commission would look at by specifically talking about preferential balloting in, its man, in the mandate it gave to the commission as something that it should investigate. Um, and it also then gave the commission a very limited time frame. This whole process only lasted about three, three to four months. And so there's quite limited opportunity for the education of the commission members who had to get up to speed because not only on the electoral system, they were looking at other issues as well, and very limited time for public uh, consultation. The uh, outcome that came from this phase two was, well, first of all, through the what public uh, consultation that did take place was, was heavily in favor of proportional representation. So people could make written submissions and I had a chance to look at those. And the overwhelming majority talked about proportional representation and were in favor of that as being the new system that should be adopted. Um, the commission produced a final report, which was rather brief and it covered a lot of issues. So it really didn't have much detailed analysis of the electoral system options, only I think about five or six pages in total for a very big subject. Um, and the recommendation, which wasn't that surprising, is that the commission said that New Brunswick should consider switching to preferential balloting. Um, and said, you know, it did say that it, had, it did acknowledge there, there had been significant support for PR in, uh, from the public that they had heard from and said that was something that perhaps could be considered further down the road. They suggested maybe the next electoral boundaries commission could look at PR, um, which you know, really didn't seem like a very, very much at all, a rather small consolation prize for advocates of PR. Um, I also, myself, I thought it was rather ironic that it, clearly there was support for proportional representation. Clearly the commission felt it was, you know, it's, it's, it was, had almost been told to look at and probably support preferential balloting. Uh, 
but it was odd then that they didn't at least recommend, well, perhaps we should have, if we're gonna have a referendum on this issue, maybe we should have a multi-option referendum with the current system, proportional representation and preferential balloting, considering that the commission thought preferential balloting was a good idea. That is to say, to allow people to have multiple options and rank them. So um, the Gallant government did announce that there would be a referendum on this preferential balloting option during the 2020 municipal elections, but when they lost power, that didn't happen. So we've had a history of two promised referendums that didn't take place when the government switched hands uh, in, uh, in New Brunswick. So to turn to talk a bit about electoral reform in the other provinces, um, well, over the last 20 years, again, a number of Canadian provinces have talked about possibly changing their electoral system, but none have actually made this change yet. And we've seen a variety of different methods of deliberation and decision making uh, in BC, Ontario, PEI, and Quebec uh, over this period. During this time, seven referendums have taken place, and all of them have failed, although I put failed in quotation marks because, for example, in the first referendum held in BC, which was in 2005, it, they did actually get 58% support for a new system a form of proportional representation, the single transferable vote, but the government had set a 60% threshold as the necessary uh, level in order for the change to go through. Um, similarly, or slightly different reasons, but there was a, a, a second PEI referendum held in 2016, and uh, the mixed member proportional system actually won that referendum, beat out first past the post, and there were actually five options altogether. So this was one of the kind of multi-option referendums, but the turnout was only 36%. So the government said it wasn't gonna move ahead on that basis. And then in a follow-up referendum uh, that took place at the same time as the 2019 Prince Edward Island election, the first pass post system ended up beating out the MMP option 52% to 48%. So that's just as obviously uh, the history in a bit of a nutshell. Um, what I will focus a bit more then is to talk about the kind of the process by which electoral reform, what, by which people have tried to bring it about uh, and to think about what's happened. What are some of the things we can learn from that experience uh, trying to, to move forward in New Brunswick? So I would say early on, there was kind of a perceived what I would call the gold standard for trying to bring about a change in the electoral system, which is the idea that you would hold a citizens assembly followed by a referendum. And of course, a citizens assembly would be a randomly selected group of citizens. And in the case of British Columbia, which held one, they chose two people from each of the ridings in British Columbia. So they had roughly about a hundred members. I can't remember the exact number. Uh, who met over an extended period of time to discuss and learn about electoral systems and then come up with a recommendation. And that recommendation would then go to the general public in a referendum. And the thinking was that then if you did both of these things and the public then supported this, you'd have had a very deep process of deliberation as well as that broad public involvement. Part of the thinking, I think at this point was that the general public, when they came to vote in a referendum, they would probably be quite heavily guided by what the citizens assembly had recommended simply because this was a representative body of citizens. They'd learned about electoral systems. They decided this is a good model to put forward. So a lot of people might simply vote that way and say, well, if my fellow citizens think it's a good model, then I, I think I'll support it as well. So this approach was used in both British Columbia and Ontario in the mid 2000s, uh, but it never it didn't succeed in, in either case because of failed referendums. As I say, the first BC referendum actually got 58% support, but it wasn't enough. And then in Ontario and a second BC referendum, the support was lower than that. It was actually below 50%. Um, so these are both good ideas in theory, but there's certain things I think we've learned from what's happened about some of the, the challenges that they present in practice. So to talk first about citizen assemblies, um, the, the first point here is probably more of an academic one. I'll just briefly mention it. Um, it, it. I don't think it's necessarily a broad public concern, but a citizen's assembly is meant to be a random selection of the population where uh, an elections body will choose people at random off the voters list for the province and will invite them to be part of the citizen's assembly. In practice, um, 
you know, an awful lot of people decline the invitation to be considered for part of the Citizens Assembly. So you have what we would, might call a kind of self-selection bias. The people who decide to participate may, they're probably more concerned about democracy. They may already have certain views with respect to electoral systems. So as I say, it's a bit of an academic concern. It hasn't really become a big, something that's talked much about in, in the public. So it's probably not something to worry too much about. Um, but as much as possible, I think you do want to encourage as best you can, as many possible people to participate in the Citizens Assembly as are invited. And uh, I think these days, if you were to hold one of these Citizens Assemblies, obviously you'd use more of these kind of electronic forms of interaction like we're having here tonight. And maybe that would help to boost the participation rate because when this was done in uh, BC and Ontario in the mid 2000s, people were getting together in person and traveling significant distances. So you can see how a lot of people might have thought that's not really for me. Um, a second concern with citizens assemblies is that in practice, I think it's turned out that uh, many in the general population just simply don't pay much attention to a citizens assembly when it's happening. I mean, many would just not be aware what, that it was even going on. They're not familiar with the work they've done, the deep deliberation they've undertaken, and they may not even know about their recommendations that they, they're putting forward. So I think what we've learned is that citizens assemblies can be a useful mechanism for coming up with a new electoral system. It makes good sense to get uh, average citizens involved in talking and thinking about the electoral system and taking it out of the hands of politicians. Uh, but I don't think they play quite the role we might have ho ho hoped for in guiding the population in their thinking. Even though, and this is the problem, another problem that we'll come to, many in the population don't actually know much about electoral systems and could use some, some guidance. So that brings me to the next point then about referendums, where we are get, trying to get the, the public at large involved. And so what are the challenges here? So one challenge is what some people have called civic literacy, that is to say just how much people actually know about politics and know about democracy and democratic institutions. And the reality is that a lot of Canadians don't know much about these things. And so they don't know much about electoral systems. And uh, this of course is gonna be difficult if they're meant to vote in a referendum, trying to decide if they'd like to see us change an electoral system. Uh, and it can be quite difficult to reach people in order edu to educate them about first past the post and alternative systems. Of course, every time there's been a referendum, there's been a public education campaign, but it has not, I think, reached the kind of levels one would hope in terms of bringing a lot of the people in the population up to the kind of levels, the kind of levels that say people in a citizens assembly might achieve. Uh, that certainly has not, has not happened. And then a second challenge with referendums is the turnout question. Um, so the turnout certainly varies quite a bit, and that depends whether or not you have a referendum as a standalone event or if you hold it at the same time as an election. And when you hold it as a standalone event, then the turnout has tended to be very low. And that, of course, diminishes the democratic legitimacy of the referendum process. So a lot of people, I think, would probably feel that if you're going to have a referendum and, and it's going to be a legitimate referendum, you probably might like to see at least 50% turnout, at least half of the eligible population turnout. And that level has not been achieved in any of the three standalone referendums that have taken place on electoral reform. So Prince Edward Island in 2005 and 2016, and then BC in 2018, which was actually a mail-in uh, ballot. Uh, of course, when you hold a referendum at the same time as an election, a provincial election typically, then you do obviously get a better turnout because people, most people accept the ballot for the, the uh, electoral uh, reform referendum and, and go ahead and vote. So you've got the examples there. But of course, presumably now we've got people participating who aren't really engaged on the issue and may not know that much about electoral systems. They're the kind of, you know, you've got a lot of people voting who would not have voted in a standalone referendum. And in general, the thinking on referendums is that when people don't know too much about an issue, they tend to kind of stick with the status quo. So this obviously is a problem for advocates of change if you hold a referendum at the same time as, a, as, a, as an election. But on the other hand, it's a problem if you hold a standalone referendum and, and you don't get a high enough turnout for people to consider it a legitimate outcome. So the referendum me mechanism is, is tricky. That's what we've learned after seven referendums across the country.
So time to consider new processes. I think so, uh, but we'll have to see <laughs> how that might actually play out. Um, but there is this idea that if one does use a citizen's assembly to examine a new electoral system, you can give it that mandate, but you can also give it a mandate to come up with the method that should be used to ratify their recommendation. So what are some of the ratification methods that could be used? Well, first of all, a citizen's assembly, if it was given this mandate, could in theory decide that it was sufficient, uh, that its recommendation was a sufficient to ratify the, uh, the uh, new electoral system. Um, you know, they are a representative group of citizens. They've engaged in a process of education, deliberation. They've come up with what they think is a better model for the province. Maybe that's enough. Now, realistically, I think a citizens assembly is going to be quite reluctant to come up with that recommendation and say, we think that's enough. We don't actually have to do anything further. So other alternatives would be, what about the legislative assembly? A citizens assembly could say, okay, we've got a recommendation. Now we think it should go to the legislative assembly, which then can go ahead and you know, discuss it as it would any potential piece of legislation, uh, potentially make amendments. And so you get the political parties involved, which is um, in many ways, I think could be a positive thing if the main model has been developed by citizens, but then the parties do get to have a bit of input at the final stage and perhaps introduce some minor amendments, that could possibly be a good thing to give this whole process more legitimacy. I do think it would be an interesting political dynamic. One might say this is a very risky approach because of course the legislature and the parties in power there could simply say, well, we're not gonna do this. We don't wanna uh, implement this recommendation from the citizens assembly. But I think that would be quite difficult politically for them to just outright reject a recommendation that's coming from the citizens. You know, the citizens of the province have said they'd like this, the citizens assembly. That would be a difficult thing for a legislature to just vote thumbs down on that. Um, now, the third option is the one that has been used. So, oh, okay, a citizens assembly could say, we think there should be a referendum to decide whether this, our recommendation should be adopted. But given some of these obstacles I've mentioned about referendums, obstacles, challenges, difficulties, um, the Citizens Assembly should be, I think, enabled to provide a fairly in-depth set of recommendations about how this referendum should be conducted. So it should be able to indicate when this referendum should be held, whether it should be a standalone event, concurrent with a municipal election or concurrent with a provincial election. It should be able to specify what the necessary threshold is for the referendum to pass. And I think a citizens assembly would likely say that the 50% threshold is sufficient, uh, that we don't have to have any kind of supermajority 60% threshold in order for their recommendation to be adopted. And I think a citizens assembly also probably should be able to weigh in on what, what they believe would be the necessary turnout level for the result to be considered binding. Um, it's a little hard to hear to know what a citizens assembly might say. It would be important that they made their recommendation based on a good informed understanding of what the experience has been. In other words, understanding that it can be difficult to achieve a high turnout level on, on a referendum. Um, and so, yeah, we, we certainly wouldn't want a citizen's assembly to come forward and say, well, we think there should be, you know, 70% turnout. That would obviously just uh, undermine the whole, the whole thing. Um, but in any event, as I say, I do think that having a citizen's assembly map out what the, how they see this referendum unfolding, obviously the, the, what they would have to say would have a lot of legitimacy. That would be, I think, an important uh, part of things. And furthermore, uh, any of the methods I've mentioned here could also make provision for a, a, a referendum to be held after a new system has been in place for two or three elections. This is what was done in New Zealand. It, I think it was after probably about four elections, but they had a follow-up referendum to go back to New Zealand voters and say, do you wanna keep the new system we've had in place now for a few elections? And in fact, they, they did wanna keep it in place. And that would be, uh, Obviously, I think that would be a much more informed vote. Everybody would have experience having voted in these elections and therefore we could have a, you know, I think a much better referendum process at that point. 
having this kind of provision would, I think, make it easier for people to accept the idea that maybe there wouldn't be a general referendum in the first place. Maybe instead you just would have the Legislative Assembly pass something that had been put forward by the Citizens uh, Assembly. Um, when we're here talking and thinking a little bit about potential opportunities for New Brunswick, um, and for Fair Vote Canada and all the people who might be active in the organization. One of the things that would likely happen if a citizens assembly takes place, and if it is given a fairly broad mandate here, not just to talk about the electoral system, but the actual method of ratification, it's likely to have a significant public consultation component to it, the citizens assembly itself. And during that public consultation process, that would obviously be a great opportunity for Fair Vote Canada people to come forward and talk about some of the things they think should be in place for ratifying um, uh, any recommendation and obviously pushing for those things that would make it, a, I think, hopefully a little bit more of a, a simpler process and one more likely to succeed than the methods that have been used uh, previously in, in the other provinces. Um, so finally, just a little bit about then some of the new opportunities that I that have, I think, precipitated this meeting uh, tonight. Um, of course, one of the big ones being that the new leader of the New Brunswick Liberal Party, Susan Holt, has indicated that she supports the idea of a citizen assembly on electoral reform. But to just to raise the obvious question, do others in the party also support that uh, idea? Um, I do think Obviously, what's going to be important is to try to maintain momentum and potential pressure on the Liberal Party to live up to that, uh, that idea if they are elected as the government at the next election. In other words, obviously, getting Susan Holt to continue to be committed to that and to recommit uh, when there is a new election campaign. I think also, again, for Fair Vote Canada members trying to engage and put pressure on individual liberal candidates at the next election to get them to come uh, speak out and say whether or not they will commit to supporting their leader's idea of a citizens assembly. Um, because all, clearly there would be within the party, I think, significant resistance to this idea because of course the liberal party does not have a, a history and tradition of being supportive of uh, a proportional representation. Um, as I'm sure we all know, the Greens and the NDP are longtime advocates of electoral reform and specifically different forms of proportional representation. And uh, finally, just to round things out, one other opportunity I think that may arise is this is also, of course, something that's been difficult to, to move forward, but lots of people are talking about it, is trying to get the voting age lowered to 16. And interestingly, the New Brunswick Electoral Commission despite its shortcomings, uh, did recommend uh, that this be something that be adopted in the province. It also thought this should be put to a referendum as well uh, to decide if this would move forward. But this would be, I think, a very positive change for a variety of reasons. Obviously, this would help to engage young people in politics at a younger age. But specifically in terms of electoral reform, I think that young people obviously are an important target audience. And I could very well imagine uh, if there were a, a referendum to be held on electoral reform, that you could get high st school students potentially quite mobilized and excited about being part of that and helping in a, in a campaign. And then actually, I think you, know, you probably have quite a high level of support for changing the system among uh, younger voters. So if, if this change can be uh, moved ahead, then I think we would also see some uh, positive spinoff effects for electoral uh, reform. So uh, yeah, so those are my thoughts then, as I say, a bit of the background history and what we can take away from it. I think we've learned a lot over the last 20 years and uh, I think we, it's great to continue. We need to keep pushing and plugging away at this, hoping to bring about this change that's been long awaited. And now in New Brunswick, there is some opening, some opportunity, and I think we uh, can see some pathways uh, forward. So I'll, uh, I'll stop there and I'll stop sharing my screen here and turn it back over to uh, Anita. All right, thank you very much, Paul, uh, for that uh, great synopsis of you know, how we got from 20 years ago to today and the efforts that have been made in New Brunswick and maybe some lessons uh, that we can take from that. I really, really appreciate it. I'm going to uh, share my screen now.
but everybody will have to bear with me while I find the right screen for a second here. Give me one minute. Okay. Here we go. Back. Okay. Can everybody see all the happy faces on the screen? Just yeah, okay, good. <laughs> all right. So I'm just I'm gonna take about 10, 15 minutes and just sort of um a little bit of what I'm gonna say is gonna overlap with what Paul said. So, you know, Paul offered us the highly informed academic viewpoint on this campaign. He's been following this issue for a couple of decades alongside us, and we are sort of the activist side of that. So I want to just bring you up to speed on where Faribault Canada is and what we're thinking in terms of New Brunswick. So again, just sort of, I only went back a couple of elections. So everybody understand I'm from Ontario, right? I'd prefer not to be doing this. And maybe in the future, it'll be all hosted by New Brunswick people. But we are starting where we're starting here. So which is with me, and I don't have an in-depth experience with New Brunswick. But just going back, you know, the last couple of elections in New Brunswick, I think have really you know, underscored the need for electoral reform. What we saw after the 2018 New Brunswick election, which was a wrong winner election, I'm sure you'll all remember that, where the party that got the most popular support got the second most seats. We had a minority government, and for a short time, we had some cooperative politics that came to the attention of people across the country. As you know, I remember the Green Party leader remarking in the news. For a short time, this must be what proportional representation is like. They were actually working together on something. It was sort of amazing. That, however, in our first past the post system was short lived. Of course, there was a snap election because that's what leaders do in our system when they see the polls and they figure they can just dispense with the need to cooperate with anybody else. And that's exactly what happened. And that's where we are now. So you can see the results in the most recent election where we've got the typical Canadian experience of 39% of the vote, leading to 55% of the seats, leading to 100% of the power, uh, pretty familiar. Uh, most recently in the past year, the Green Party of New Brunswick put forward a motion in the legislature. So you remember that Paul was referring to the commission put forward by Gallant. It basically started with the white paper saying, we want winner take all rank ballot and then the hand-picked commission, and then they came out with a paper saying, let's have winner take all ranked ballot. Yeah, not a great process. Okay, so one of the recommendations that did come out of that though, was uh, the commission managed to say, when the boundaries commission is doing its work, maybe they could just sort of look at proportional representation models, how that might work. So the Green Party put forward a motion for that, and uh, this was just in the last year I watched, oh, I watched about half of it, and I can watch a lot of things about PR for a long time, and I had a really hard time watching this. Um, this debate was rather painful. So this was the uh, motion that was put forward in the New Brunswick legislature. It was just asking the Boundaries Commission to take a look at this, like in, in theory, right? In theory, if we were going to have a proportional system in New Brunswick, what might, uh, what might it look like? And so they had a debate on that. And here are some of the kind of things that I heard. And like I and like Vivian, I've been doing this for 10 or 15 years, and I've heard a lot of debates that, among politicians on this. And this one, it wasn't a total rock bottom, but we're we're kind of skimming the bottom of the barrel there in terms of the content. Um, you know, we have the liberals with came out with their line, well, you know, nothing's perfect. That's a typical liberal line. Nothing's perfect. Everything has trade-offs, you know, there's good things, there's bad things, nobody's perfect, you know, why are we making this change? And then you have, and that's just sort of a um, little humor for anybody here. This is from uh, 1923 here, where uh, the Progressive Party MP is complaining and saying, I find there's a tendency on the part of men, mostly men back then, who are opposed to hunt up all kinds of objections they can find and think they have proved their case because the new system is not perfect. And this of course was uh, a debate in response to the first liberal broken promise 100 years ago, right? It wasn't perfect enough then and it wasn't perfect enough this year in New Brunswick to have a meaningful debate. And then we had the conservative, um, progressive conservative MLA who was basically comparing it to a sports game and saying everybody, everybody can't win, 
uh, in life, everybody doesn't win. There's winners, there's losers. That's the way it is. I mean, in much of the rest of Canada, the electoral reform debate has sort of progressed beyond that to get a little bit more nuanced, but I wasn't hearing that yet in New Brunswick. So that sort of gives me an idea of where the two larger parties in terms of maybe their elected people might be at um, in terms of this debate. So I'm putting this forward because I'm just saying we have a way to go. We have some work to do in New Brunswick. And of course, um, at the end of the day, every single liberal and conservative uh, in the New Brunswick legislature voted against the motion to have the Boundaries Commission look at PR. And then, as uh, Paul mentioned, we had an unexpected and hopeful development, which was in part due to some work of, uh, of Vivian Unger, who's on this call. <laughs> uh, we, but we had a, a candidate running the, for the New Brunswick Liberal Leadership Race, Susan Holt, and she was supportive of proportional representation and supportive of a citizens' assembly on electoral reform, which is Fairwell Canada's preferred um, path, next step. And so uh, she answered our questionnaire very positively. She's so far been quite consistent. The others were either for winner take all rank ballot or not interested, just to give you a, a flavor. And she said that it would be a priority for her and she would, um, she would move on this if she was elected leader. Keeping in mind the fact that it's one thing to say something during a leadership contest, and it's quite another to get your MLAs and your party to come along with you. So that's where she is now. So I want to just take a couple minutes for the, if there's anybody that hasn't followed Fair Vote Canada kind of closely for the last four or five years, why we are asking for a citizens assembly on electoral reform. Why don't we just do it? So one of the reasons we, we can't just do it is because it's just, there's no path to just do it. There's never this, there's never this idea, when there's this ideal situation where we have, say, two or three parties that have a majority of the vote and a majority of the seats, and they sit down in a room together, and they uh, hammer out a compromise, and they implement it. I, I hope that happens one day. I really do. But there's no jurisdiction in Canada where that's the political reality. So Fairville Canada, after 20 years, has to kind of back up a little bit and say, what's the political reality in any given jurisdiction? What can we do that's going to strengthen our movement? What can we do that's going to um, have le legitimacy, to use one of the words that we hear from political scientists and politicians, that's going to have the most legitimacy and it's going to advance this conversation rather than run it into a wall? So in 2020, the OECD did a great study of 279 citizens' assemblies. And I'm calling them all citizens' assemblies, but I just mean processes that use the same model, but the scale would vary. And they looked at, uh, you know, what are the best practices? And they're highly recommending this process for issues that are just like this, issues that are um, not intractable, but where politicians are in a conflict of interest where it's complicated, where there's trade-offs, where it's about values, where it's more important than one electoral cycle, where it's not a yes or no question. These are the kind of issues that are really good for citizens' assemblies. And in citizens' assemblies, you're going to get informed citizen judgment. So try to think of it like informed consent. You know, what we can get um, in a referendum is a judgment for sure, but how informed that is, there's a big knowledge gap. Again, citizens' assemblies give politicians legitimacy to make tough choices. So if you have politicians that are sort of wanting to move, but they need more public backing, a citizens' assembly is a great way to do that. It also enhances public trust by giving citizens a role, because one thing we've learned from um, many, many referendums and processes is if citizens get the idea that something's cooked up in a back room, it's not going anywhere. So public trust, especially on this issue, is really, really important. Citizens' assemblies also make um, the decision more inclusive. So we all know there's always these groups that just don't participate in our political process. They don't have, they don't have input, and it's really hard to reach them. A citizens' assembly, by the way it's set up, brings those people into the room to share their opinions and share their lived experience. Citizens' assemblies also make sure that people with money and power don't have an influence on the decision, and they are a perfect uh, counter way to counteract polarization and misinformation because that just doesn't come into play in a citizens' assembly. 
So we've been campaigning for citizens assemblies, like I said, for the past four or five years. Um, in the Yukon, we just won, uh, for those on our mailing list, we just won a next step victory uh, on, in the Yukon Committee on Electoral Reform, where they are going to be going out to all Yukoners now again and asking them if they would support a citizens assembly on electoral reform. And that was the hard work of our Yukon team over the last year and a half to get that done. Uh, we had a small win in the at the federal level last year where the uh, Procedure and Health Affairs Committee voted to do a study of a citizens assembly on electoral reform, which may not seem much, but really when you look at the fact that Justin Trudeau slammed that door, bolted it and put chains on it and basically said, that's the end of this, you know, six, seven years ago, to have the six liberals in that committee vote, yes, let's look at this idea again, was a big win for us. And we will be back fighting for that again in this parliament. And again, last year in Ontario, we did a poll in advance of the last Ontario election, just polling the public what their response would be to this kind of idea. And what we found is that uh, people in general are quite su supportive of the idea. You'll see about 34% didn't know. That's because they have no idea. They don't know what a citizen's assembly is. They don't know what electoral reform is. <laughs> They're just like, I don't know, right? But of those that did have an opinion, you can see there was very little opposition to the idea. And that's across all parties. So the idea of bringing citizens together is something that's widely supported across partisan lines. I want to touch a little bit on referendums. Paul spent quite a bit of time talking about referendums, and I want to just talk about the Fair Vote Canada perspective on referendums. It's been a painful 20-plus uh, year process of coming to this realization, because when I started in Fair Vote Canada 10, 15 years ago, people would sit around in a room and talk about how if we just had the, the right ballot. You know, it, it would be a two-part ballot, or it would be a ranked choice ballot, or it would be just one system, or it would be two systems, three, three systems, or it would be this kind of question or that kind of question, you know, or if we had it at the election, or if we had it outside the election, or if we had this kind of pamphlet, and believe me, I heard it all, or why don't we just do it like they did in New Zealand, as if that's some kind of a manual. 20 years later, and seven referendums, and the one in the UK, which was on alternative vote, which also failed um, the winner-take-all rank ballot, that also failed spectacularly for the same reason. Uh, we are not in favor of referendums on electoral reform <laughs> because we don't feel that you get a good informed decision. And that the research around the world shows that the no, si the no side has a humongous advantage in a change referendum. So this is uh, the charts that you're looking at were done by Professor Lawrence LeDuc and he looked at referendums around the world and said, you know, a month ahead of the vote, uh, where was the public support? How many people said they were going to vote yes for change compared to what actually happened on voting day? Massive drop, up to 20 points. And this was replicated by another researcher in the UK who looked at change referendums and showed, you know, six months ahead compared to voting day, up to 20% drop. So that's not to say it's impossible to win a referendum for the change side, but it's so hard, especially on our issue where it's extremely hard to get people engaged enough to get informed enough. And the messages that we're competing with are tricky. And so, uh, Frank Graves, who is the president, is the president of Ecos Research, uh, talked to us a couple of years ago and basically said, you know, if you don't leave the starting gate with 70 or 80 percent support, you're not going to be successful because anything you put forward is going to come under attack. No matter what it is, it's going to come under heavy attack. And the experts, um, you know, who run the referendum industry in California, basically, they won't take on a campaign like a public uh, yes campaign unless they're polling. 70 to 80 percent uh, a year out, and at least 55 percent strong support. Not the kind of I agree with the principle kind of thing, but strong support. Because otherwise, they basically say what Professor Nelson Wiseman told the Electoral Reform Committee, don't waste your money. And so that's sort of where we're at. Referendums for us are not a gain, they're a, they're a, they're a fail, because when they fail, they slam the door on reform in that jurisdiction for usually 10 or 20 years. They demoralize supporters. So what our opponents have done over the last 20 years is basically normalize that there must be a referendum. And that's actually not how electoral reform has been adopted around. Most of the world has adopted PR without a referendum, but our opponents have succeeded in putting the idea in the mind of people that the only way to be legitimate 
is to have this referendum and they know this research and that's why they're doing it. So where are we in New Brunswick? What do we need to do? Well, we have an exciting opportunity. So now I've got past the bad part, right? This is an exciting opportunity. It's the first time that there's been um, a liberal leader who's been in favor um, as well as the Green Party, obviously, that we have two parties, two leaders, I should say, <laughs> now in favor of changing the electoral system and open or in favor of something more proportional. So what we like to do, what we try to do in Fairville Canada is to get at least two of the parties to find common ground before the next election. So what we don't want is a battle of the system. Because in a battle of the systems, we always lose. So if we have the Liberal Party running on their winner-take-all preferential ballot, and we have the Green Party running on their favorite PR system, and they're both saying, if I'm in power, I'm just going to do it. I can just tell you, I am hate to disillusion anyone, but it's not going to happen. A party that wins 60% of the seats with 39% of the vote is not going to bring in proportional representation. It's, it's never happened in history. It's never even come close to happening. It would mean that 20, 30% of their caucus would disappear overnight. Can you imagine the pushback they get in the back room from that? As soon as they look at a map, they get massive pushback from their caucus. Going back to 1979, when Pierre Trudeau tried to float this idea to the liberal MPs, it's the caucus that will push back. In Quebec, when Francois Legault promised it, it was the CAC caucus that pushed back and said no. So what we need is, we need a process, we need the parties to agree on a next step. We need them to agree on a process. If the Liberals and the Greens can get in a room and agree on a proportional system, I'm all for it. Yay. But, it, but if they can't, let's say Susan Holt can't quite bring the Liberal to long, that far along, okay? Then what we need is something that's going to get us farther ahead. So where we go from here is that we need to build Fair Vote Canada, New Brunswick, need, need to build in general, and when I say that, I mean in general, support for proportional representation in New Brunswick and support for the parties to run on a common process so that there's a mandate, because otherwise people will say you don't have a mandate. When it was just your party saying this, you don't have a mandate. So we, we want them to have something in common that's going to help us going into the next election. And so we need to build this. And you can see there's a small group of us on this webinar. It's the first webinar we've ever had in New Brunswick provincial about provincial reform in Fairville Canada ever. We have, what, two years before the next election? Three years? Two years. We have two years and we have a long way to go. Um, so we will be having a follow-up meeting after this meeting for everybody that wants to volunteer uh, and help. And there will be a huge opportunity coming up to engage with the New Brunswick Liberal Party, because they will be doing an engagement um, in when trying to shape their platform, and that's when they're going to need to hear from us. Okay, so I think is that it for me. It is. Okay. Just going to stop my share. All right, so thanks for listening through all that, everyone. Uh, I'm going to ask Paul and Vivian to turn their uh, mic back on and we are going to take some questions and I'm going to direct as many as I can toward Paul since he is our expert guest and I have the first question here what is the main argument against proportional representation who would like to take that I mean I can offer my views I mean I think the two main arguments you typically hear are that you won't have majority governments, you'll have coalition governments and coalition governments tend to be less stable um, and less effective. Um, and of course the counter argument is that in, in a lot of places that use proportional representation, their governments have been just as stable. They last their full mandates. Uh, they're very much able to get things done. And of course they're able to do things on a more inclusive basis. And I think also when you have that more inclusive basis, sometimes it allows the government to even move ahead a little more forcefully with certain projects because it does can say we represent, let's say 55% of the population and therefore they feel they do have a true mandate to move ahead with some new program or initiative. A government that's been elected with only say 39% of the vote, sometimes it will think, well, 
sure we have a majority of seats, but we don't really have the backing of the full majority of the people. So maybe we better be a little bit cautious here. Maybe we better think about this. So I actually think coalition governments that can actually potentially be more effective because of that, that mandate. And then I think the second key point is that you can have the, you do have smaller parties, obviously more likely represented, and some of them can be extremist parties. I think right now with today's politics, that's certainly an argument that people will make. Um, I mean, I think in the end, that's potentially true. Uh, I, but at the same time, that mechanism of having that threshold in place, that 5% threshold will keep you know, the truly fringe parties will not actually find a place in the legislature. A party will have to get above that 5% threshold. And once that happens, I mean, a democratic system has to kind of, you know, it has to deal with it somehow. If, if, if you have 10% of the population supporting some extreme viewpoint and they get zero representation in the legislature, those people are gonna to wanna to have some kind of influence or say, and I don't know what form it's gonna take if they don't have any representation in the legislature. So uh, anyway, but those I think are the two main arguments against are they people don't like coalition governments because they're unstable and they don't like small fringe extreme parties getting a place in, par in parliament or the legislature. Vivian, did you wanna address that? Uh, yeah, just I wanted to say that uh, I got a request in the chat for a link to a study you mentioned. You said that there was a study done by the OCD, OECD. Yeah. So I will. Sorry. I'll put that in the link in the mail that I send to everybody. Oh, okay. But it's it's right on. We have a whole website about citizens assembly. <laughs> now, for the last few years, it's called nationalcitizensassembly.ca. Okay. And if you go on there, I've got a link to the OECD study and some nice videos about citizens assemblies and that kind of thing. It's designed to um, speak to people who aren't like PR fanatics, but just might want to find out how the citizens assembly would work. So did you um, have anything you wanted to say about the last question, Vivian? Um, well, maybe I could make the point that um... First past the post doesn't protect us from extremists. Instead, they find a way to infiltrate the major parties and uh, they can become the, the prime minister or um, or the premier. Look at uh, Daniel Smith in, uh, in Alberta, a lot of freaking out going on over her. Yeah, and of course, in the United States, you have Donald Trump becoming president. So yeah, it's, it's funny that that, sort of thing doesn't put that argument to bed but I yeah I mean if I could speak to that a little bit that's a the I mean there's a whole list of arguments against PR and you know what they are by looking on our website and look under fact checkers and mythbusters <laughs> and there's like about 10 or 12 of them and they just play on a continuous loop for yeah. like decades and it doesn't actually matter what's on the ballot or it's the same stuff that comes up from people, but in terms of generating an emotional response of no, it's the extremism that people are afraid of. But I think that that's actually starting to shift. I think that since we've seen first the election of Donald Trump in a winner take all system, then we had uh, the, the freedom convoy for a month there in Ottawa. And, you know, now we've seen, you know, uh, just different things like the conservative party leadership race was sort of informative. And now we have Daniel Smith. And, you know, I think people are starting to clue in that, you know, when Justin Trudeau slammed the door on PR years ago saying, well, we don't want extremists, that you don't actually mm -hmm. keep people out with first past the post. You just, you just, they just channel in another way and it can be more destructive than it is if you just give people a voice. Yeah. Okay. Um, what's our next question here? Why have a referendum at all, either provincially or federally? I think we've sort of answered that one. Paul, do you want to take that? Well, I mean, I definitely agreed with what you said, Anita, that there's yellow. Yeah, I mean, my presentation more or less was pointing in the same direction that you know, if you could avoid a referendum, you would, but politically it can be challenging because it is kind of the expectation and norm that's been set up 
Um, and it is a method that's used for deciding important issues, you know, obviously around the world. Um, I guess um, I, I guess I might actually come back to you with it, a question, Anita. I was curious what Fair Vote Canada thinks about pushing potentially the idea of let, if we're going to have referendums, let's have them after new systems are in place as kind of a you know a mechanism to see if people like it after two or three elections um, as a way you know, but having some other method for putting it in place in the first place, a citizens assembly or, or some other approach. Honestly, Paul, I don't think there's enough evidence for that one way or the other. I know they did that in New Zealand. So, uh, you know, it's sort of like, if we look at over 80% of OECD countries use PR, and we have two cases where they were adopted by referendum, okay? So that was Switzerland in 1918 and New Zealand in 1996, right? And so most of them, they were just adopted by either it was written, either it was written in their constitution or they were adopted by the legislature. And so the, the political cooperation is what also gives it legitimacy. And I heard that over and over when I spent five months listening to those federal ERE meetings and all these experts come testify and they were asked the same question over and over. What would give us the legitimacy to move forward? <laughs> and, the, and basically the experts would, be, would say, you know, if you can get two or three parties that represent a majority to actually agree on something, that's a lot of legitimacy to move forward. And so I, anyway, yeah. So a referendum after two or three elections, I would say different, a lot of our folks like that, our supporters like that, they have an idea that once people get used to it and stuff that it's gonna be easier to win. I'm not sure about that. I think it's gonna depend on um, what length of time has passed. So, I mean, the first, uh, PR election in New Zealand, the first government didn't go so well yeah. because all their studying up on how to cooperate didn't work because they, you have a bunch of people in there that had no idea how to cooperate. So, I mean, I think that their first government was a bit of a mess. And if you had gone back like three or four years later and asked New Zealanders, okay, do you want first past the post back? Some of them might've said, yeah, bring it on. You know, so when they had that confirmation referendum, that was 15 years later and five elections later. So by the time they had it, the people, a lot of the old politicians had retired or phased out of the system. And PR was like the status quo for a whole generation of people in New Zealand. So the chances of moving backward at that point were really small. But if you have it very soon after you adopt it, those same players that want to keep first past the post will say and do all the same things that they do now to ensure that they get their preferred system back. So I'm, I think I'm, I'm pretty much on the fence. I didn't see it helped us in BC. I don't know if everybody knows, but in the last BC referendum, you know, one of the things from John Horgan was, well, you know, if you adopt this new system, we'll have a, a referendum after two elections or something. And then if you want to get rid of it, you can. It didn't succeed in reassuring anybody. The people who are going to vote no still voted no. And the ones that are going to vote yes still voted yes. And I'm not sure it really unfortunately i don't think it made a huge difference so yeah. the answer that's is i don't know yeah that's all very helpful <laughs> is that helpful yeah. yeah okay um what else do we what else do we have here um how would the public be educated pre-pr system before a referendum Would, who would you like me to? to take, who wants to take that one? Uh, my part, for my part, I'll just toss out social media as obviously having a strong social media strategy is going to be really important to try to reach uh, people who maybe don't follow politics as closely and to meet, reach younger people. So TikTok or whatever the latest you know popular thing is at that time. And if if there are the resources, you know, hiring people who know how to do that stuff. Uh, can coordinate a big social media campaign. I think that would be a big part of, of trying to be successful if there is a referendum and a need for education. I think I would just say, having been there, tried that, done that, and you know, listen to um, you know the experience of people who have tried to do that and who passionately want to reach out to the public passionately want the public to read the pamphlet 
and to, and to get why this is good and what and how it works and why it's exciting and why it's a positive change and why you can trust it and having been there this is an extremely difficult topic to reach the masses about in in any depth um, and I can just say that from experience and having so many different teams in different provinces not just Fairboat Canada try really tough I'm going to go back to the citizens assembly with that and one, one thing that Paul mentioned that is, uh, is an issue is the benefit of a citizens assembly is not just getting a demographically representative sample to make a fully informed, wonderful decision. You can have 102 people have this really meaningful, life-changing experience in a room for a year or whatever, but if nobody else in the province knows that it happened, it's not useful. What you end up with is 100 people who feel like the government threw them under the bus. And that's what happened in Ontario in 2006 when 103 people gave their a year of their lives to talking and making a recommendation for how to make democracy in Ontario better. And in the end, people went to the ballot box and had no idea that the Citizens Assembly had happened. None. You know, they would ask the polling clerk, what is this? What's the Citizens Assembly and electoral form? No idea. When the Citizens Assembly at a press conference, a student newspaper showed up. There was no support from the mainstream media. There was no support from the government. And even in BC, there was no um, educational mandate for the assembly to go out and really connect after the assembly with, uh, with people across the province. So if you're going to have a citizen's assembly, it's not enough to have it in a quiet back room. It has to be fully funded, endorsed, and taken seriously by the government. Again, this is where the government leadership comes in. The government needs to say to people, we are having this process because this is a serious issue that we want to solve and we trust this process and here's who they are. And let me just say that here's who these people are is so much more important than this is the geeky set of options that they will be studying in depth. You know what I mean? It's, it's in BC in the first rep, first referendum, part of the reason they got that win, part of the reason was that people saw it's people just like me. They felt like they knew somebody on the assembly because it was it was just like the population of British Columbia. And that instilled that trust. And trust is going to, we're going to be able to get trust a lot better than we're going to be able to, uh, for people, millions of people to understand the minutia of electoral systems. So in terms of the education, I would just say put it, put it in the assembly phase, give it to the assembly to be able to reach out in their communities and make sure that everybody knows this is happening on their behalf. And you know what, I just want to give one quick example, and I know I've given this on webinars before, but it really, to me, shows the contrast. In France, they had a climate assembly, a citizens assembly on climate. In the UK, they had a citizens assembly on climate. One was basically treated like a quiet little advisory group to a government committee that nobody ever heard of. The other one, the president went out and basically publicized the heck out of this to the point where 70% of the population knew that this citizens assembly was happening. And when they came down with their recommendations, everybody knew that the recommendations were out and whether the government was following them or not. And that's what we need. Um, what else do we have? Vivian, do you wanna read the next question? Okay, the support of Susan Holt for electoral reform is very promising. As you noted, however, support might not be widespread within the party. How likely do you think it is that a citizens assembly would indeed take place under a liberal government in New Brunswick? Paul and Vivian, I'm not from New Brunswick, so I'm happy to defer to you. Okay, I, I guess I could take a stab at it. Uh, I think, you know, it'll depend on so many factors like whether Susan Holtz is able to win some people over within the party because as you talked about before uh when that motion came up in the legislature the reaction was just pathetic and um then there's also whether they get a, a majority government and my opinion is if they get a majority government it's just forget it there there won't be anything um probably not even a citizens assembly, which does cost money. And that can always be the argument, you know, New Brunswick is in debt, citizens assemblies cost money. I think um, I'm kind of hoping that they 
that they'll get a minority government rather than a majority, but um, they're currently 40% in the polls. So um, I guess Blaine Higgs would have to learn from the charm of uh, Doug Ford. I don't see it myself, but apparently he's got some kind of charm. <laughs> so if Higgs can charm them into thinking he's not so bad after all, maybe, uh, I don't think he'd win again, but maybe we'll get a minority government. That would be my best case scenario anyway. So yeah, I mean, I would just back up what Vivian says, where the the things have to align for us. And in every situation, we work as hard as we can to get that alignment, but some things are out of our control. So we need two parties to run on a common ground platform. How are we going to get there? Well, the like I said, the New Brunswick Liberal Party is going to be doing an outreach, a consultation over the next probably might not start till 2023, maybe even early 2024 about, and they'll be asking people, what do you want to see in the platform? And that's when Fair Vote Canada supporters need to talk to your friends, neighbors, colleagues, and get them to show up and feed in to what you want to see in the platform. Um, and yeah, and obviously a minority government, we need that because I don't think we'll get too far on electoral reform in any false majority government. So we have a possibility with the Liberal Party don't write it, I would say, don't write it off. It's a new opportunity. Um, it's a new opportunity in New Brunswick and we wouldn't be doing this if we didn't think there was a chance. Um, what else do we have here? Um, Vivian, do you see one that, that you'd like to? Remy's got a really interesting question, but I, I wouldn't know how to answer it. Shall I read it? Yeah, maybe. you'll have to answer it, though, because it's about New Brunswick provincial politics. Maybe Paul can take it. Yeah. Um, Remy's question about how electoral systems change the political culture and government and how could they have, how could it have changed recent events in provincial politics? I mean, I guess I, I would just give what I think is kind of the, the most common answer people would say is simply that it obviously leads to a more cooperative political culture. Um, every party recognizes that at certain points they may end up working with other parties and they can't afford to engage in the same kind of, you know, vitriol and criticism of others and that they do making the others the enemy. Um, instead, they sometimes have to work together so it can lead to just a more cooperative sort of uh, atmosphere. And uh, I mean, Anita had that um, slide showing the leaders of the parties coming together to to work on during the covid period and have a kind of you know coalition of sorts on on with respect to some of those issues um and yeah new brunswick at various points did do quite well in terms of coming out with a good strong public health response and feeling like everybody was on board so that's that's a good example um and obviously so with every every issue you can have that sense of more voices being heard um, and again, I, I would underline the point to this argument, then it ties into the argument that when all voices are heard or more voices are heard, governments are more empowered to do to, to act. Um, they have stronger democratic legitimacy and that gives them the power to get things done that people wanna get done. So yeah, I guess that's, those are sort of my general thoughts on that question, unless there was something more specific you had in mind about specific events you think have been really problematic. I mean, there'd probably be a long list, but. <laughs> Actually, I had a thought about um, the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic when the Conservatives had a minority government and also they had um, Dominique Cardi, who, and that was an important part of it. But in any case, they, uh, I think they did quite well and we had low case counts in New Brunswick for a long time. And then, of course, they, they uh, did their... Um, snap election and got the majority they were looking for and then things slowly but surely went down the tubes cooperation disappeared i think pretty much they had a committee i think an all-party committee on the pandemic and i think that kind of fell apart if i remember correctly so that was actually pretty illustrative of uh, how things could be different under pr yeah was a great example uh we have um patrick saying um what has the 2018 New Brunswick election, which had mainstream attention across the country because of first ever minority government in 100 years, 
due to new parties being elected but not accurately represented, as well as the shocking mixed results of PC and Liberals in popular vote. Uh, liberal win and seats the PC one taught us about electoral reform and the need for PR in New Brunswick. Okay, this is sort of a complicated question. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I maybe I'll just pick a couple of things out of there. Um, so these some of these things are sort of out of sight, outside of our control, but they really help. So when there is a wrong winner election, uh, that helps the electoral reform cause immensely because it gets the mainstream media talking about the system is broken. Um, so that's really good. Um, in terms of new parties, yes. So the closer we get to a two-party system, the less likely we are to ever see proportional representation. So I want everybody to remember that. So one of the misconceptions about PR, you know, and Dennis Pilon talks about this all the time, is that, you know, you get PR and then all there's all these parties. It's more the other way around. The more parties are elected in a legislature, the closer we are to a breakthrough on proportional representation. The multi-party system comes first, and that adds pressure for proportional representation. So the more we have different diverse parties represented, the more we have minority governments, uh, there's actually been research showing that when you reach a certain threshold of number of effective parties, then you cross that uh, like more likely line to the country switching to PR. So we don't, strategic voting actually works against us getting proportional representation. Um, so the small parties are an asset. They're, they're a challenge sometimes because people don't always like the small parties, um, but they're also, they're also showing how the system's not representing people. How do we make this an election issue and have more uh, date on this issue? I'm not sure. Maybe he meant data. Oh, data, okay. Um, yeah. And so there's, we're gonna take two more questions before we finish out for tonight. So. The first one is, how do we make this an election issue and have more data on this issue? And then we'll move on to Remy's question about the language issues, which would be great for Paul to address. So let's start with the first one. How do we make this an election issue and get more data? Do you, would the person who said about the data put in there what kind of data you mean? That would probably help, because I don't know. So I think I, I'll take the one about how to make it an election issue. I can tell you that right now from so many election campaigns. As soon as it's in the Liberal Party platform, it's an election issue. <laughs> as, long as, as, as long as it's just the NDP or just the Green Party or just one party in a small party, it doesn't matter the media doesn't care. At least I can say that federally and in most provinces. Maybe New Brunswick is different, but in general, as long, if, if it's just a smaller party or the third party that wants it, the media will just ignore it because they basically decide that it's hopeless. Once one of the, the big ones uh, says we're gonna do something about this, that's when it becomes a, a hot issue. So the work ahead of the election in the next two years with on the New Brunswick Liberal Party to show them that this is a popular issue is, is the best way best way we can make this an election issue. Um, and data, did they put, oh, debate. Okay, same thing, yes. That's how we can have more debate on it. I mean, obviously, you know, there's all the obvious things, right? If I, I mean, Volunteer, we're going to have a volunteer meeting. We need people to help on social media, create a Fair Vote New Brunswick social media presence. We need people um, to write letters to the editor. You know, we need people to uh, make that are work, that are within parties already to make sure that they're bringing this up at events. I mean, there's all kinds of things you can do. Okay, do we have uh, the last one? Question I wanted to take before we close off for the night. Is a very interesting uh, one from Remy. How might a proportional electoral system influence tensions around language issues? Paul, do you want to start with that? Uh, well, I guess thinking on the fly a little bit. Um, I mean, 
any time with a first past the post system, you can obviously have a party elected with, you know, 38, 9% of the vote um, in a province where you do have a, you know, a language divide, you know, that government can, can obviously be primarily uh, elected by one of the language communities, by the, the majority language community. And, you know, with the conservatives, we do have that, that dynamic to, to a, a significant degree. I mean, so with proportional representation, governments are going to have to represent uh, a majority of, of people. It seems substantially more likely that the government's going to have to have some representation from both language communities or at least to, in order to, to, uh, to be able to govern. Um, so I would think at least, and that's, that was one simple reason why you might expect language uh, conflicts to be diminished for there to be greater cooperation between language communities as an abstract sort of answer. So that's one, one contribution perhaps. Vivian, do you have any thoughts on that? Hmm. I, I don't really know. And now we've got Blaine Higgs just is an anti-bilingualism kind of person. So him having a majority government uh, obviously increases tensions. If he had a minority government instead, maybe it would, there would still be some tension around him just being the premier. So not sure. Yeah. Hey, so I think we've pretty much taken most of the questions. I'm, I'm really glad to see uh, that some folks showed up for this, for this first discussion. And we will be having um, a follow up meeting for volunteers and just basically to talk about how we can get Fair Vote Canada off the ground in New Brunswick, what kind of outreach we can do so that we can grow our numbers. Um, so that, um, you know, so that in the next election, we have platforms that are very hopeful and we have politicians that are hearing it at the door. Thanks ever so much uh, to Paul for, do you have any closing statements or words, Paul, you'd like to make or Vivian? Uh, no, I just wanna thank everyone for being here and uh, I hope it's been helpful and I uh, look forward to seeing where things go. It's an exciting opportunity or we wouldn't be here. So, you know, I'm excited and I think, and there's a chance that we can make this happen. And so I think it's worth us giving it everything we can to give it a big, big push. All right. Okay. Have a good night. Okay. Bye.